It's a tremendous pleasure for me to introduce um, James Simmons and, and, and what is probably my, my favorite title in this whole conference. Now, what is it like to be a bat? <laughs> uh, depending on how senior you are, you might or might not have read the famous 1974 article by Thomas Nagel, What is it like to be a bat? Um, which was about the, the difficulties imagining yourself into the mind of an animal with a sensory world that's wholly different from our own. And Thomas Nagel, of course, is a philosopher. He had no idea about the sensory neurophysiological underpinnings of, um, of bat echolocation and so on, of which he was well aware. But he said it actually doesn't matter um, that he can imagine what it might be like to have different sensory powers um, and so on. He said that that's that's not really the problem. The problem is to imagine what it's actually like to be that winged animal that's uh, poorly sighted and and finds its way around its environment by sending out sound signals into the environment. So the big question of how one might imagine what it actually feels like to be that bad. Um, but that question by and large to this day remains unanswerable and so the more interesting way in my point of view is is the one that um, Jim Simmons is going about it that is to um, study the the sensory mechanisms and neurobiological underpinnings of that that process and that I think tells us more interesting things there are to know about the what the world looks like from the cockpit of a bat than um, than, than fundamentally unanswerable questions. So Jim Simmons' um, list of prizes, I've just found out, dates back to the 1960s when he was awarded the James McKean Cattle Prize um, and later the National Institute of Health Research Scientist Development Award, both in the 1960s. He was elected a fellow of the Acoustical Society of America and of the American Association of the Advancement of Science and um, the most recent major award is a silver medal in animal bioacoustics in 2005. Jim, I'm tremendously looking forward to this oh, talk. Thank you. Thank you. Let me move over here and get the microphone in range. Right. Sorry about being the actual person and not all of those things, okay? That can't be helped. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to talk to you about bats, echolocation, and from the main point of view is what do they see with their sonar? What does their world look like? What are the mechanisms behind it to some extent? And what does this tell us about what it is like to be a bat? Now, um, when I was a graduate student in about 19... 68 or so, Thomas Nagel visited our lab with Donald Griffin, who was when he was at the Rockefeller University. And uh, Nagel had spent some time that year with Griffin talking about the question of, of uh, what it's like to be a bat. And because we were the only people at that time doing behavioral studies of bats, and we were doing psychophysical experiments, we were actually asking bats what they see under different conditions. He brought us down, he brought Thomas to the lab, and we spent a lot of time showing him bats, doing things, and discussing his point of view uh, on the problem of what it's like to be a bat versus the radically different one that both Donald Griffin and I had, which was the one way to find us to ask the bat. Uh, it's a tough thing to try to crack by just thinking about it. You need to ask questions and find data. A fundamental problem we have in talking about this is that the auditory sense produces images that are quite different than visual images. And at least in the bat, as far as we can now tell, the auditory system doesn't rise to the cortex and then produce vision-like images of sounds. It just doesn't do that. Auditory images bear no significant relation to visual images except for the fact that they happen and we experience them. There's a living quality to audit auditory uh, stimuli and auditory images that is absent from vision, even from motion picture vision, without sound. Uh, back in the, uh, about in the last 10 years or so, several wax recording drums were discovered using Thomas Edison's apparatus, um, 1870 or 1880 so perhaps. Um, there were little wax drums 
And the device basically is the, the first type of phonograph where you speak into a, a, a little horn with a diaphragm on it and a needle on it, and the needle inscribes the sound wave on the wax. Okay, you can't play it too many times before the wax is destroyed. But two of these discs, a bunch of them were actually discovered in Europe when one of these devices was taken there. Two of these discs are of extraordinary importance for a lot of reasons. One of them is the voice of uh, Otto von Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck, thank God, for, your, for North America, we had already separated from Europe. But Otto von Bismarck and the other person who is on the, uh, the second disc, Helmut von Molke, had an enormous influence on Europe right to the very moment we speak. I won't evaluate to you whether or not it's a positive or negative influence. I think most people in Europe have come to the conclusion it was a terribly negative experience. Otto von Moltke invented the concept of the army general staff, which is a mechanism that allowed German dominance of, of the European semi-continent right up to just before 1945. Otto von Bismarck created the German Empire and ended the French Empire. Uh, and, and began a whole sequence of, as a result of French, uh, of, of French republics. Um, the thing that's interesting, just as an aside, is when you listen to these things, go to, go to, go to Google and type you, YouTube and, uh, and type the voice of Otto von Bismarck or voice of Helmut von Molke. Otto von Bismarck's tape is him singing a German uh, drinking song. All right, he was a hail fellow well met in spite of what he did. Uh, Helmut von Molke was a very smart man. Um, his recording says in German, essentially, I am speaking to you in the future. I am in your past. He understood immediately that this sound recording was going to be around for a long time and that it allowed him to say things to people who hadn't even been born yet. The living quality, if you, you know, when you pick up the phone, someone calls you, you pick up the phone, in just a few words, you can generally identify the person, you know, who it is, even if it's someone you have not spoken to in years and years. If you heard this tape, there's a good shot, if you had the Helmut von Molke here, you would be, ah, that Helmut, <laughs> that's him. The voice is live, the experience is live, and it is all there. This is not something that can be explained by imagining the brain producing pictures of sounds. It produces sounds of sounds, and that's very different. All right, so go, go, if you get a chance, go Google those and take a listen, all right? That's the first part of this, all right? Now, the history of this begins with Lazzaro Spallanzani in the latter part of the 18th century. By the way, Helmut von Molke is the only person in the world for whom we have a sound recording, and he was born in the 18th century. He saw Napoleon Bonaparte himself. How's that? He could, you, if you'd ask him, he would tell you about it. This history stuff goes everywhere. It's because we're always living in the middle of it, not necessarily to our advantage. Uh, let's go back to Lazarus Balanzani. He was a, uh, uh, the founder of modern experimental biology. He made several extremely important experimental discoveries. He was the first person to officially establish that artificial insemination led to pregnancy in mammals. In other words, the finger of God didn't do it. He also was the first person to demonstrate that when you sterilize something, meat, you, ste you, you sterilize it and put it in a sealed container, it doesn't rot or become covered with mold. The basic idea being that life begets life. You don't have the finger of God say, okay, now there's mold. That doesn't work. Those two things, both of which involved negating the finger of God, got him into a lot of trouble in Italy, you might imagine. Okay, he was an abbe who was a, a lay member of the Catholic Church. He did most of his work at the University of Padua. He also was the one who discovered that digestion is a chemical process. The stomach is both warm and mechanically active when there's food in it, but it's also filled with chemicals. He, was the, he, he basically put little bits of food in, in the bladders you would use for making sausage, put them in the stomach for 20 minutes, then pulled them back out on a string demonstrating that it's only contact with the liquids in the stomach that cause digestion to occur and not the mechanical churning, okay, thus overturning one-third of Greek science in a single afternoon, okay. Keep in mind that the people now living in Greece bear no relation to the people who lived there 3,000 years ago. It's a totally different place. All right. The fourth thing he did was to study echolocation in bats. He was concerned about their ability to navigate at night and not bump into things. 
So he basically did the first experiments on this. They were crude. He blinded the bats and by poking their eyes out and let them fly around in a room with obstacles and basically concluded in an agonizing letter to his colleague, a man named Jurin in Switzerland, my God, do they see with their ears? He had no notion that they were making sounds. The types of bats that make sounds that are audible to humans are not found in, in, in Northern Europe. You have to go far south in Italy to find bats that are, when they go over here, choo, 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 you know that there's sound involved. That was important. So um, um, from a cultural point of view, it's important too, because if you've ever seen or heard of the opera, um, serious opera, people call it an operetta, by, uh, by uh, Offenbach, The Tales of Hoffmann. The first part of that is about a man who built a woman mechanical robot, and somebody falls in love with the robot. Uh, much anticipating the talk we heard yesterday about artificial intelligence and robots. The character's name was Spallanzani. And in European cultural history, he is roughly the equivalent of Frankenstein. He's the evil professor, okay? Anyone who touches bats and gets involved in them becomes an evil professor. Just ask the president of the United States. All right, now, what Spallanzani did was initiate a train of scientific research that led to the discovery that bats emit high frequency sounds and find their way around using echoes of those sounds. The experiments were done in, in Boston, Massachusetts at Harvard uh, in about 1939 to 1943 by Donald Griffin and by a man named uh, Bob Galambos. Galambos did experiments recording electrical signals from the inner ear to demonstrate that the bat could actually hear the same high frequency sounds it emitted. And since then, people have been studying this for a long time. Our concern about this is how it works. And to some extent, how this addresses the question of what the world looks like to a bat. That, of course, doesn't prove that they're aware. But that requires thinking more, using the word proof in a different way than I think I'd like to. We just find out what bats do, see what they see, and learn something about that. If you have a cat at home, if you have a pet cat, you're in no, there's no doubt in your mind that this animal is aware. Not only is it aware generally, but it's aware of you particularly. And there's just, you, it doesn't work any different way. The fact that it doesn't talk is not going to solve the problem of how can I prove the cat is aware of me. Well, that's probably not really all that interesting a question in the long run. I'm only going to be here for a certain length of time. So is the cat, but better to just be with the cat in that time. It's not a solvable problem, I think, without working on the cat and asking the cat to tell you. Anyway, that's the spirit of this. All right. We don't take prisoners. So if you have questions, ask them at once, all right? Because if you don't understand something, then it will compound later. So please immediately ask questions. Like I say, no quarter is given. All right. Here is a poem just to show that there is a literary dimension to this. Uh, this was published in an article uh, in what's called Trends in Neuroscience back in 1978. I didn't even know it existed back in 1978. The article was written by... Uh, by Alvin Novick on his travels around the world with a big tape recorder and a bat detector to discover that there are bats all over the world that make echolocation sounds and find their way around acoustically. At that time, it was thought only to be true of big brown bats and little brown bats in New England, okay? So it's not true that New England is the center of the universe, all right? I was, however, taught when I was a student in, the high, in like grade schools around Boston that civilization kind of fizzles out south of Hartford, Connecticut. It was years before I discovered that that was by, quite by accident correct. All right. Now, this, uh, let's go here. This is the story here. Uh, this is just boilerplate. It's the stuff that you put on grant applications, all right? But you can read it, all right? If you can't, you know. It's not that important. The main point is that we're interested here in doing, in, in asking the bat what it perceives. And the first part of this is just finding ways to watch bats. Back when they were discovered in, um, in the um, early 1940s up through about 1960, no useful methods existed to make visual recordings of what they did outdoors. Cameras uh, were insensitive to light. 
um, video equipment didn't, the video recorder didn't show up until the early 1960s and it was physically very large. The tape was this thick, a roll of it was this big and you could barely get 15 minutes of television program on it and the quality was terrible. Uh, there wasn't an, until about 1985 that useful methods became available to look at bats while they were in the field. I'm going to show you some videos here. The sound doesn't work. Uh, we had trouble with that, but you can't hear bat sounds anyway, so what's the point? All right. I'll just show you a few. These are videos taken with a heat-seeking thermal imaging camera that sees bats from their body heat. It's sensed to relatively long wavelength uh, infrared. This shows a bat catching a flying insect. If you see the little dot right there, that's the insect. Did you see that? Not so good? Turn the lights down a bit. That would be useful. Yeah, I don't know where the switches are. Do you have the light switch control back there? Oh, it's up in the front. They always do that. They put it in a place where, yeah, okay, thanks. All right. Um, bats are warm-blooded, of course, um, but beetles and, that's, let's try it. This, this is one of the very few where you have to see that kind of thing. There's a little spot that the bat then intercepts. Most night flying insects, beetles and moths, for example, are warm blooded. And they have to sit on the ground or in a tree and beat their wings to warm the body up. And once we're done, once we're done with this video, we'll turn it off. The lights can go back on. That's good enough, all right? Keep going, turn them all off and then yeah, start over, yeah, okay. That's fine, we don't need to do that anymore, okay? All right, let's try one more time. There's a little spot right there, which is the beetle. This lets you actually observe them doing this sort of thing outdoors at night. The cameras are thermal imaging, they're, um, they're uh, the complicated devices. You can get little simple handheld ones now where you can go look at things like this. But in those days, they were somewhat heavier. The date of this is uh, 2000 there. All right, here are three bats chasing each other in a dogfight, an aerial dogfight. If you could hear the sounds, it'd be kind of like Snoopy and the Red Baron because you would hear this like that, which is the sounds of the bats using sonar to interrogate each other. And they do this, the first, this is the first night we took these things out and it became clear that bats do not spend most of their time chasing flying insects. They spend most of their time doing what birds do, chasing each other, all right, for reasons God only knows, all right. Um, this is a bat called Glossophaga. It is a hummingbird feeding bat. This is in Costa Rica. This is a hummingbird sanctuary in the mountains near Monte Verde. People go there to take pictures of the brightly colored hummingbirds. And then the, it gets dark and the people leave. And then much more, no, more numerous collection of bats come out to do the same thing at the hummingbird feeders. Their echolocation sounds are relatively weak and difficult to record because one of their problems, they live in a place with larger bats that eat other bats. And so they don't want to alert these other bats to their presence. They do fly in, in groups. They just watch these little hummingbird bats flying around in the trees uh, and the trunks of the branches. It's mostly just to give the idea that whatever birds do, bats do it too. And whatever we think that the birds might be capable of, we're forced to have to assume that bats might also be capable of. All right. Here is another example of a dogfight. These are fruit-eating bats flying through a fig tree. Just watch for a few minutes. They're chasing each other in and out of the branches using echolocation. It's totally dark, okay? How an animal using echolocation or essentially sound radar can find its way through the branches of trees while chasing another bat. This is, you know, this is a toughie, all right? The research we have been working on for the last half century or so has been funded by an agency that is very concerned with duplicating this capability in a machine, say a torpedo or a rocket. It's the Office of Naval Research in the United States. And if you think that's hard, this is the backside of the football stadium of Texas A&M University at dusk. This is the part of the stadium that people leave when you come out of the football game to get back to your car or to walk home, all right? 
Nobody knew these bats were in the stadium until one day, a football stadium, a soccer stadium or a football stadium is used at a university in the United States six times a year. For the other six games are played at some other university soccer stadium or football stadium. It's one of these very expensive things that has next to no useful function except six times a year. So nobody knew about this. There was a thunderstorm one night and the game was postponed for about 20 minutes and when people came out at the end of the game, it was dark these bats are flying around at, foot, at chest height. So you walk into this situation, all of a sudden you're completely surrounded by bats flying all over the place. They were surprised, okay? Most people don't like to get in a situation like that. And you can imagine there was a lot of yelling and screaming and general upsetness, okay? All right. Also, I wouldn't recommend eating the hot dogs in that stadium because they're covered with little black flecks and it's not pepper, all right? <laughs> Okay, now, all right. Here we have the bat we study most. It's called the big brown bat, Neptesicus fuscus. In Latin, Neptesicus fuscus means brown house flyer. They're a house living bat in North America. Um, and as a matter of fact, that's protected them because many of the cave eating bats in the United States and in particularly Eastern Canada, the Atlantic provinces have been practically extirpated by this fungus disease called the white nose disease. Uh, the bats are coming back with an immunity to it, but it's going to be a long time before their publication, their, their population levels come up. These bats live in houses. They're not exposed to the cave environment and to the problems of the fungus. That's why we use them. The sounds, they, it's got a wing spread of about a foot, okay? Um, the signals they emit cover frequencies from about 20, 22, 25 kilohertz up to about 100 kilohertz, so they're not audible to us. Now, to a young person, when I was a graduate student or younger, you could hear bats. There's a faint ticking sound that you can hear, probably as a result of these very intense sounds. These are the loudest sounds animals make in air, 130, 140 decibels. Um, you can hear this ticking sound because it's driving your auditory system quite hard. So you hear this faint, but I can't hear that now. Um, and as time goes on, it, it's harder, yeah. All right, the sound has two frequency sweeps in it. It's an FM sound, frequency modulated. One harmonic, the first harmonic sweeps from about 50 to about 25 kilohertz. The second harmonic sweeps from up here about 100 down to about oh, 45 kilohertz or so. The higher frequencies here, above about 90 kilohertz, are rarely emitted into the space of the air in front of the animal. They're mostly limited by the filtering properties of the vocal tract. But the harmonic structure is crucial for how bats do things, as we will see. Now, don't forget, if you have questions, ask them right away. All right, all right. Now this just now this shows you there's a soundtrack on this, but I'll make the sound. I'm, first, I want you to concentrate on just watch a few times the movement of the animal. This was shot with an iPhone, not my iPhone, which is an antique. All right. Now, th what I want you to watch and look at now. All right. Notice that as the bat flies along, its head appears to follow a smooth trajectory. And all of the parts of the body, the wings, the body, and the tail are oscillating up and down, but in such a way that the body is rotating around the head. This is stabilizing the sensor apparatus when the bat's flying. Rather than having the head bump and up and down, the bat's biomechanics move the whole body up and down and have found a solution to a problem where the center of gravity is moving, but something that's not in the center of gravity is stabilized. Sure. Um, uh, maybe, let, no, let's not, no, I'll just say it, that's, as she said, what happens when you watch a pigeon walking, for example, is it'll move with its head going stationary and then jump and move and jump. It's the same kind of thing, I think. Right, so they'll have the, like the heron would do that, or a, or a crane, it'll move its head like that and then it keep its head stable and walk the body up to the position and do, it's the same kind of thing, I think. Notice that, however. There's a whole lot of the biology, the peripheral biology, just in pictures like this, all right? I will imitate the sounds. The sounds are emitted in pairs with the wing beats with a slightly longer time interval between the sounds. So it's kind of syncopated, it's not, it's, 
And that's important because in this room and in most of the world that the bat lives in, where there's vegetation and things on the ground, the bat has to simultaneously deal with objects that are relatively near, a near branch of a tree, for example, and far, the surface of the pond, the other side of the tree, and so forth. When an animal using echolocation or radar, or plane using radar, operates in a complicated environment, near objects have to be reacted to quickly to avoid a collision. But if you emit sounds rapidly to deal with the near object, echoes from further objects will start to occur and arrive after the wrong sound. This is, creates a problem called pulse echo ambiguity, and it's one of the major problems of a radar or sonar system. You don't want to emit sound A, get an echo from this of sound A, emit sound B, get an echo of this from sound B, and then get an echo from the wall from sound A because that mimics an object from sound B that's much nearer, but it's not there. All right, that kind of phantom error problem is a giant engineering problem in radar and sonar. The bats solve the problem by alternating the signals. So I'll do it one more time. The sound doesn't work. All right, I can also do it so you can hear the bat do it. You can't hear a thing, right? I'll do it again. <laughs> there, I can easily imitate bad sounds. Okay, now, all right. This is a picture of a flight room. That we're looking down on a room that's, oh, I don't know, about eight meters long, and we hang vertically pla plastic chains hanging from the ceiling because they're a good acoustic model of branches and leaves, but they're acoustically controlled. We know what the echoes are like. And the bat is released to fly down one or the other side of this Y-shaped opening in the patterns of, uh, of the hanging chains. It's a test of their ability to operate in cluttered surroundings. Clutter is the word in radar or sonar that refers to all the other stuff that produces echoes besides the target. So you have a target and clutter. And besides ambiguity between short and long range things, the problem is to see the target and not see the clutter. All right. We solve that problem in vision, largely at the periphery. When you look at something, you're focusing the image of that part of the world on the fovea of the eye. We have lots of photoreceptors and lots of neural mechanisms that allow you to identify what it is and sort contour and color and movement and so forth. The surrounding visual field, which is the peripheral part of the retina, is extraordinarily low resolution. So if you look at something very directly, you fixate it with your eyes, you can tell what it is. The stuff around it is increasingly more blurry as you get further and further away. You can track objects that are around the sides. For example, when you're walking in a room like this, you walk over here on the corridor, you go up like that. You're not looking at the surrounding things. You're looking at the empty space you're walking into. And the visual periphery is dealing with the, uh, with the guidance problem. All right. Psychologists have often called this effect perception versus action, which is another example of psychology developing for no good reason and an ideological explanation of something. It's astonishing how psychology can keep turning up things that ought to be biologically true or interesting into actually philosophical and ideological arguments. Do we have perceptions other than because to control actions? No. That kind of stuff. All right. Okay, now when you record the sounds of bats flying in this room, like this, and then you reconstruct the sounds from a whole bunch of microphones or mounted on the walls, you can see that every single one of the sounds has this characteristic harmonic structure. So it's not just, for example, that, uh, here we go, that this picture here has harmonics, it's that all of the bat sounds have harmonics. The two harmonics are a crucial part of the bat's version of the processing that creates its equivalent of this central foveal focus. We'll come to that. All right. all right, now. The sounds that the bats emit are beamed to the front, aimed in the direction of the mouth being opened. And, but the sound, and so they're illuminating the space to the front in much the same way you're looking that way when you're walking and you're using the fovea of the eye. However, the sounds, just like the visual field, are spread all around you. The bat doesn't aim a narrow beam of sound. It illuminates the entire hemisphere in front of its head. And this is a picture. It's a video showing a reconstruction of the movements of the bat. And essentially what you have is dots where the bat is, a vector, a red vector showing the direction of the bat's head aim. 
and then around the room, the strength of the same sound at the different microphones, which gives you some idea of the spread of the sound inside the room. All right, the length of the vector is in proportion to the uh, strength of the sound on the microphones. The basic idea is that the beam is wide. All right, this, here we go. All right, now if you draw pictures of the beam, here's a big brown bat flying directly towards you, okay? Um, the transmitted beam at four different frequencies, 25, 40, 60, and 80 kilohertz, is so, and at 25 kilohertz, the lowest frequency they emit is essentially omnidirectional. It's only a few decibels down all the way over here at 90 dB, 90 degrees. So they, they illuminate the entire world with the lowest frequency. As you go to higher, higher frequencies, the beam becomes less broad. But you wouldn't use the word narrow. A sonar system or a radar system that used a narrow beam would have a pencil-like point of beam that's only a degree or so wide. Bats don't do that. And there's a good reason. If you're using a radar or a sonar to paint a picture of something with a narrow beam, you have to move the beam back and forth across the object in order to reconstruct the image. Bats don't have time for that kind of thing. So they emit a sound that illuminates the object and all the surrounds and then do processing in the auditory system to reconstruct the shape of the object, to identify it, and at the same time to segregate it from the surroundings. In other words, the, this foveal focus, equivalent of vision, and the surrounding uh, following of stuff, but not for identification. Any questions, by the way? I need to keep reminding you that we don't take prisoners, okay? It's just too much trouble. Okay. Uh, I didn't catch the comparison to foveation. Okay, good point. All right. In vision, when you are interested in looking at something, you, 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 you fix that object with your gaze on both eyes. The foveal region of, of the two eyes of the retina has a high resolution, spatial resolution, and a lot of color. You can identify the object from shape and, mem and, and all kinds of stuff, and then you remember what it is and can classify it. Um, objects off to the side, even just 10 or 15 degrees off to the side from the fovea, are perceived with much lower spatial resolution. That's basically it. And if you want to identify something that's off to the side, you don't stare here and then struggle to figure out what this is over here. You shift your gaze and you look at the different place. That's all. The bats have to use an acoustic method to reconstruct this functional or psychological equivalent. All right. This is a video showing a bat sitting on a platform aiming at a screen with several hundred microphones, and they're used to reconstruct the beam. So what I'm going to show you here is that essentially I can't read the, the frequencies on here. The resolution of the video is too low, but basically this is the sound spotlight of the bat or the acoustic footprint, if you will, of the bat. As you go to higher and higher frequencies, the beam illuminates a smaller and smaller part of that surface, but you would never call it small. Down here at the highest frequencies in the sound, the beam is still relatively large. It's tens of degrees wide, not half a degree wide. I'll play this so you get some idea the bat is, is scanning an object. This is the spectrogram of the sound in this picture right here, so you can see the harmonic. I'll play it several times. Whoop. <laughs> Zero times. Here we go. Ready? Now what you see is the movement of the bat's beam as it scans back and forth, presumably looking for something. It's sitting on a platform. It's been trained to do that, and it's scanning this surface. I'll do it several times so you can see. Amazing. I hate when you click off the image. It doesn't do that. There you go. <clears throat> You can see that the spectrogram of the sounds are changing. The bat's going chirp, 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 like that. And we're just getting a picture, a video of the scanning movement. Please, the broadcasting and don't, the don't ask questions from there. Watch the microphone. Please. I will, yeah. What's the question? The broadcasting and receiving beams are like column different. Uh, okay, yes. This is the transmitted signal spectrogram. And this is the beam itself at different frequencies going from about 10 kilohertz to about 100 kilohertz. So each of these panels is a slightly different frequency going higher and higher and higher and higher. 
All right, now to try to describe the problem here, here's the bat emitting a sonar sound like this. The beam of the sound is aimed in front of the bat. Now imagine you have an insect here, which is a target that the bat's trying to find, and it's surrounded by echoes from vegetation. And these echoes from vegetation are the clutter. All right, the bat wants to see the insect, locate the insect, and if necessary, identify whether it is an insect, because there are lots of things like leaves floating down and things like that. The bat wants to catch the insect. But as you can see from the distances here, the echoes from the insect are arriving at the bat's ears roughly at the same time as some of the echoes from the vegetation. Yes, question going to microphone. Is it working? Okay. Um, do they perceive like the sounds coming differently, whether it's, a, it's an insect or a leaf like dolphins would do? Because dolphins can make the difference between plastic and metal, per se. Yes, the uh, those same kinds of experiments we and others have done with bats, and they do the same thing. They basically, the good way to put it is the echoes sound different for different kinds of objects. Okay. But what they do in classifying the object is retained in the domain of sound. All right. In other words, don't say, ah. They, they do a reconstruction, which I will get to later, okay? And, but yeah, in fact, one good way to think of this problem is what is it like to be a bat versus what is it like to be a dolphin? Because dolphins also use echolocation underwater, and a lot of the things that they do seem similar, and yet nearly all of the actual mechanisms are completely different. Dolphins go click, bats go chirp. Bats use their ears, their mouth, the way we use them. Dolphins emit sounds through a sound generating organ in front of the skull that projects the sound out through an acoustic structure which is superficially similar to a lens. It really isn't. Focusing a beam into the water, the sounds are received along the jaw bones and along the sides of the head and conducted to the inner ear. It's different peripherally, but we think a lot of the basic processes are similar. Of course, we could be wrong. In fact, we probably are, but what can you do? All right. The basic problem, the basic solution for the bat is echoes from the insect, because the bat is fixated on the insect, return with all of the frequencies that were in the original broadcast, except for whatever the insect shape might modify, the spectrum, so to speak. Echoes from the surrounding clutter are off the main axis of the beam and are more strongly illuminated, or the word is insonified, only by the lower frequencies in the echo. And because the echoes coming back from the surrounding clutter have the higher frequencies weakened, that helps the bat suppress the interference caused by the clutter echoes. We'll come to that. All right. So the basic idea is you have a tunnel of space, an insect in it, surrounded by other stuff. For the moment, we're going to go and look at the problem of the clutter itself and how bats operate when they're flying in complicated surroundings. Here we go. This is a room with lots of black plastic chains hanging from the ceiling. We have several kilometers of chains, which we bought from a company in Hong Kong, which sells chains, plastic chains. Um, several kilometers of chains turn out to be a serious storage problem. All right. Chains are unique. A chain link is a solid thing. A chain is a solid thing. But a pile of chains is not. It's a liquid. All right. If you have a pile of chains in front of you, that pile of chains is going to settle down on the ground. And if you're in the way, you might get buried by the chains. Don't be fooled. It's like trying to move a water bed with water in it. Don't do it. <laughs> Because all of a sudden what you have is a big rubber bag filled with water and it behaves totally differently when it's in motion, right? And it's heavy, so once it gets in motion, it tends to stay that way. I would recommend not having it go downstairs, for example. I once saw one go through a wall. That's nice. Um, this is a picture of the chain flight room um, here. This is a picture of sounds returning to the bat's ears. So if this is the broadcast where the bat goes chirp, we get echoes now from the succession of change, chirp, 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 off until you get to the distance to the end of the room. This is a good example of the clutter problem. If you're flying along and you're a bat and you have chains on the left and chains on the right, how do you know that there's a hole between these? Because the chains on the left and the chains on the right are returning echoes to both ears at about the same time. The bat has to decompose this very complicated acoustic scene into, the, into knowledge of the emptiness of the space in front of it so that it can go into that space and not have to worry about a collision. 
This is compounded by the fact that because the chains are very close to the bat, the nearest chains are very close, the bat has to emit sounds rapidly to guide itself to prevent hitting the nearest chains. But if it emits the sounds rapidly, it's going to get confused by these phony echoes that are from longer distance chain, chains for any given broadcast. It's a real problem. Um, this is a hard thing for bats to do. And one way to look at this, if you want to study gaze in vision, you, put an, you, you look at the, uh, the person's eyes with an eye tracker, or you look at the animal's eyes with an eye tracker, and you figure out how fixation changes, how gaze moves over time. In the case of the bats, we're interested in the timing of successive broadcasts, which is the time equivalent of gaze. Don't forget, everything that happens in vision spatially happens in sonar in time. All right, here's a picture of a bat flying in a tunnel made of hula hoops. All right. The hula hoops, each of the rings on the hula hoop is an acoustically serious challenge because the bat sounds impinges on the ring and every part of the ring produces an echo. It's a continuous surf source of echoes so that you can't see the hole in the middle of the hula hoop because in all directions you're getting an echo. It becomes a problem. Everything okay? All right, good. Um, the bats, when they fly in a hula hoop like this, they try to bail out. They'll fly past half a dozen hoops, turn, and try to squeeze their way out between the hoops. Whereas for the experiments with the chains, they have no trouble flying along the length of the chains. This is so challenging that the bats that behave differently in the chains, even though that's a difficult problem, uh, the bats that behave differently in the chains, when they're in the hula hoops, they converge on a single strategy. Now, this is a pattern of sound emissions. Every time the bat flies, it makes about 30 or 40 sounds. Like that. And what we hear are plots of the intervals before and after each sound. I won't go into the details, but it's a, it's a time domain footprint of the sound. It's technically called a first order autocorrelation function for the sound sequence. And it shows the pattern of all that for any given sound, the time interval before the sound relative to the time interval after the sound. And what you see here are clusters where before and after the bat is tending to make a short, long, short, long, alternating, da, 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 like that. But there are also lots of sounds that happen at intervals that appear more, not fixed in terms of this alternating pattern. This is a bat named Gwen. By the way, bats have, tem have temperaments and individualities, so we don't name them with numbers, we name them with names. And these animals, Tessicus will live 30 years, even though it weighs 20 grams, okay? Try that. Yeah, um, it, we don't know why. Uh, there are a lot of biological questions, like how on earth do they do um, RNA, DNA replication and protect it from the normal mutations that would occur? Lots of neat things about them. A two-year-old mouse is a, a, is a miracle. A two-year-old bat is normal, okay, very young. Uh, so you have these footprint patterns, and you can see here's a bat, Gwen, that made sounds in a rather scattered pattern. Here's a bat, Ramses, who came from the Brown University's Egyptology building, by the way by the way, um, the sounds alternate more, but the patterns are different. When you move the same bats into the hoops, the patterns are the same. They're converged on a single solution to the problem of flying in an extremely difficult cluttered situation, which is the hula hoops. All right. These are plastic hula hoops that we ordered from Amazon, I think. And after you use the hula hoops in the bat room, you have this problem of what do you do with hula hoops that are exposed to a biohazard? <laughs> Another issue. All right. We tried some hula hoop work in China at Shandong University once, and we, one of the students went out to buy a hula hoop and brought it to the lab. We discovered that in China, hula hoops have a steel core. Hula hoops in China, using hula hoops, it's a blood sport. It's a different business entirely. All right. This is a, um, it's an informational analysis of the sound sequences in the chains, which is relatively easy, versus the hoops, which are the black bars. I'm not going to go into the details of this. This method called SSIMS, or spike train similarity space, was developed to compare nerve spike trains in the cortex of monkeys to study the problem of can you use information about nerve spike trains recorded from electrodes to develop a prosthetic system for controlling the limbs of someone whose spinal cord has been damaged but whose motor neurons are workable. Um, 
that works. This is being done at Brown University and a number of other universities. But the spike train pattern, essentially what you see is in chains, which are hard problem, but the bat considers easy, there's a uniform distribution of these, these synthetic distance measurements. I won't go into the detail. If someone asks later, we can talk about it in the chains. But in the hoops, which is a very difficult problem, all of these distance measurements converge upon a smaller, tighter distribution indicating that the strategy has become more focused. All right? That has to do with flying in the clutter. Right, how are we doing on time, by the way? Your time limit has been rescinded. You can use the entire time, and you'll, be, you'll have a discussion with that one. Something is wrong with this statement. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> right. How much more time would you like? Um, no. <laughs> that, I, that, that, that's a bad question. I mean, did, <laughs> did somebody and ask Emperor Maximilian that um, of Benito Juarez in Mexico when he was stood up against the wall? How much time do I have? Right? Anyway. <clears throat> okay. Senco de Mayo and all that stuff. Okay. Now, um, just to give you some pictures of objects, um, insects like discs, like mealworms or moths or beetles, consist of a cluster of two or three or four strong reflecting points. They don't look like visual objects, they look like places on the, uh, on the insect that reflect a tar an echo, a reflection of the incident sound. The best way to think of this is imagine, imagine that a moth or a mealworm is made of glass and then you shine a flashlight at it, you're going to see two or three brightly lit highlights, very tiny and close together. That's what the sound produces. It produces multiple reflections arriving very close together in time. They're called glints because they're glints in light, and we call them glints in sound. A disc, for example, produces a reflection from its near... Imagine the sound is coming from the left here. It produces a glint from the near edge and from the far edge. And as the disc rotates, these two glints get closer and closer together until at 90 degrees you get only a reflection from the flat perpendicular surface of the disc. Mealworms produce a strong echo from the front end and the back end, and then some little tiny weak echoes in here, which turn out to actually be the little legs of the mealworm. There's a surprising amount of information about the shape of objects, but it's embedded in the time series of the reflections. All right. These experiments on mealworms and discs were done in the 1950s and early 1960s at, at Harvard University by Donald Griffin and by a group of people working with him, um, Jerry McHugh, a radar person, and so forth. Um, uh, the bat, you throw the, a, a bunch of discs up in the air. They're Necco wafers, the little sugar candies that are made in Boston. You throw them up in the air and you throw a mealworm with them. And the bat will go in and find the mealworm. It takes it a second or two to figure out which is the mealworm and it'll catch it. It won't catch the discs. They'd learn to do this. All right. It's fast. All right. So this is, this is essentially a kind of cartoon test where you have a disc which is easy to describe acoustically and a mealworm which is edible and easily described acoustically. By the way, the researchers would then pick up the echo wafers and eat them. They're good. All right. This is a video showing succession of echoes of bat sounds. There are these FM echoes from the surface of a, of a, of a moth dangling in front of a microphone. And you see this right here. See, what's happening is that the echoes from the moths essentially have the same shape of harmonic structure, but there's shifts in little holes in the spectrum based upon the reflections from the different parts of the moth, mostly the head, the abdomen, and the wings, interfering with each other, causing little local nulls in the spectrum. These nulls are what the bat uses to tell that it's a moth, that it's moving around and what its size is. The bat executes a computation in the auditory system called deconvolution. It turns those nulls into estimates of the distances between the parts of the moth. So it actually sees the moth as having pieces in space, even though only sounds are carrying the information. This is the reflections themselves. And you can see, basically, if you look at this, not close, not too closely, closely enough, you can see that there's several pieces of the reflection, and they're moving around as the, as the moth meets its wings. Let's go to this here, all right? Now, what bats do is they see things in terms of the time delay of the echo. Bat emits a sound, sound travels out, comes back, returns to its ears. It estimates the distance to the object from the time delay of the echo. Because the insect echo is coming back with spectral notches in it, 
it's actually there are multiple reflections that are very closely spaced. So the bat measures the distance to the object from the time delay itself. Then it takes the spectrum of the echo with these little local nulls, which you saw in the video, uh, those little local nulls, it inverts them back into time estimates. So it says, ah, I have a moth at, at, at 70 centimeters, and that moth has a wing and a head and a tail, each at 9, 12, and 15 millimeters. It sees the shape of the object along the axis of distance. This happens independently at each ear which provides a stereo view, so the bat can see the horizontal position of the insect and the horizontal position of each of the parts of the insect relative to the first part of the insect. So it sees, it sees the insect from the beginning edge of the echo, then it sees the shape of the insect in spatial units, angular units, from this transformation of the spectrum. It's called deconvolution. All right. It's a French radio astronomer named Yvon Biro, who liked to collect ferns, and he visited our lab because the neighborhood collects of ferns, and he was the first, oh, these bats are doing deconvolution. I said, well, what's that? <laughs> Being an experimental psychologist, I knew nothing about any other field, particularly anything mathematical. Um, and it turns out he was right. Okay, so when a bat measures distance, let's imagine this picture here. Imagine the bat is over here on the left side of the graph, and it emits a sound like this goes ping, and then it gets an echo, ping. It uses the time delay of the echo to measure distance. So here you have an echo arriving at a, de a, de at a delay uh, that's equivalent to uh, about a meter and a half, actually 30 centimeters, sorry, up here. It's an echo delay of, what is it here? That's wrong. That's milliseconds. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. No, none of us ever noticed that. That's milliseconds, not microseconds. So the bat measures delay there. If you double the distance, it measures the delay right there. The experiment that we were doing when uh, Thomas Nagel visited our lab was we would pick up the bat sounds with a microphone. So the bat would go chirp, and we'd pick the sound up with a microphone located quite close to the bat. And then we would delay that signal electronically and return it to the bat from a loudspeaker. Okay, so the bat goes chirp, and a short time later, it gets chirp, as though there were an object at a particular distance, but there's no object there. Now, this was done in 1970, 1968, 69, 70. So this is the actual first occurrence of auditory virtual reality. We would call it that now, but nobody used the term then. The equipment had vacuum tubes, by the way. Um, yes, so it's a long story, okay. <laughs> now you would do it with a computer and it wouldn't work. Because as you well know, computers actually don't work. This is all illusion, right, okay. And if you try that sort of thing digitally, you get in all kinds of signal processing problems because the bat makes a chirp, and then 25 milliseconds later, it makes another chirp. In the meantime, the computer is still trying to figure out what to do with the first chirp, and it doesn't take long to realize that a very expensive signal processing system operating digitally doesn't work. But if you do it with electronic equipment that, that delays and analog stuff, it works fine anyway. This is what happens when the bat sees the distance to the object in terms of single, there's a single reflection, a single object. When you have an object that has two glints or two reflections to it, even though the first and the second reflections add together and interfere with each other, so what you see is one echo plus interference, the bat decomposes that spectral interference and sees both the front and the back of the target anyway. That's the outcome of the deconvolution process. They reconstruct the object in spatial terms, even though the original stimulus is not in spatial terms. Now that's actually an important philosophical problem in the field of perception and psychology. Is perception, the reconstruction of the stimulus, of, of the object that you're interested in perceiving, or is it just some processing that happens because of the way the eye or the ear works? Well, these animals are reconstructing the object in units of millimeters or centimeters. This is a sufficiently serious departure from human psychophysics to suggest there might be a principle here. All right. All right. Now, this is an interesting result here. I just want to we'll, we'll go until you guys say stop, all right? Because my rule is talk until half the people leave the room. In the auditory method of talking is talk until 6 dB of the people leave the room. And that doesn't sound quite so serious. Half the people leaving the room is, is, a, is a serious value judgment. Six decibels is practically in the noise, okay? Uh, when you give the bat an echo, 
from an object where you would deliberately misline the first and the second harmonic to disrupt their harmonicity. If you look at this, let me just go to the next picture Question. so I can explain this. Oh, sorry, go ahead, yes. Does the bat learn different objects by memorizing the pattern of the glints? In other words, how does it know a mealworm from a leaf? Okay, well, in the, those experiments with the mealworms of the discs and mealworms in small plastic spheres, they clearly learned it. The first couple of times you throw the stuff up, they catch both the discs and the mealworms. But over the course of several days, they only catch the mealworms. Um, this gets complicated, and I might as well explain why, all right? At the, there are about a thousand different bat species in the world that use echolocation. Bats, like big brown bats, emit an enormously broad range of frequencies from 20 kilohertz all the way up to 100 kilohertz or more. There are bats that cover a range of frequencies as wide as 150 kilohertz. Dolphin clicks have a very wide band under and, and are used to produce very high quality images. The quality of an image is proportional to the bandwidth. More frequencies, better picture. All right? There are lots of bats that under certain conditions don't emit such a wide range of sounds. All right. Um, one example of that is the red bat of North America. Um, and the work that has been done, I'm talking about it by students of Brock Fenton, who is a Canadian bio bat biologist who I first met when he was at Carleton University up in Ottawa. Now he's at, uh, he's, he's emeritus at Western Ontario University in London, but he lives in Toronto. Have you been to London? <laughs> Toronto, okay. Toronto, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the other bat lab is the man, uh, it's done by, run by Paul Four. He's at McMaster University in Hamilton. He actually has a colony of these big brown bats that he's breeding. It's hard to get bats to breed. You don't just say, okay, breed. It, you have to recon reconstruct all kinds of stuff. Anyway, um, let me just show you this picture here. You have these frequency sweeps. The, the, this is a sideways spectrogram. We'll come back to why in a minute. You have these FM sweeps like this. If you deliberately electronically separate the harmonics and time them differently, it breaks their coherence. In other words, this frequency right here is half of this frequency right here. But if you misalign the harmonics, you break up the two to one ratio. In humans, when you listen to music, that's, that's harmonic, almost all human biological signals of speech, music, and so forth are harmonically structured stacks. When you misalign the harmonics, you create dissonance. Slight amounts of dissonance are an important part of music because it's part of the thing you manipulate to change the perception. But when you listen to a sound that's dissonant, you're listening to a sound that has a less quality, a less well-defined pitch. The more the misalignment of the harmonics in frequency and time, the greater the dissonance and the more, and the more you are unwilling to say that has a particular pitch. Okay. So what the bats are doing is that they're using machinery for pitch to identify this, this deconvolution structure in echoes. Um, so if you take the harmonics and you split them, so this is a target with two glints to it, an electronic target, a virtual object. They're separated by some number, not in microseconds, but in, I think 300 microseconds, which is a third of one, all right? When you split the harmonics, you still see this red curve has peaks indicating that the bat knows what the delays of the harmonics are. But they are raised up on this pedestal of errors, which is a blurring, a disruption of the pitch percept, in this case, the delay percept, when what this means is when you hear a pitch that's, and in human terms, you hear a pitch that's dissonant, in the background there's another pitch at a different frequency or different, a different rep, rep rate um, that's not dissonant but is totally consonant, you can easily penetrate that scene and determine and, and perceive only one sound, the one with the highly defined pitch. The bats are defocusing the the delay percept, which is analogous to pitch, in order to see the things that are around the things that are defocused with greater precision. Uh, essentially, that's how the bat deals with, with vegetation. It focuses on the insect, sees a very sharp time delay structure. It uses the missing frequencies off to the side to defocus the images of the clutter so it can see through the clutter and see the insect. All right. There, you better have questions, okay? I, I have no clue what I just said, <laughs> all right? <laughs> okay. 
Uh, here we go. All right, one of the, the, the lots of things that are weird about this. Um, here you have a bat FM sound. Again, it's a sideways spectrogram, so time goes from top to bottom and frequency left to right. If you systematically remove by electronic filtering frequencies from the echoes, you discover, and this is the error rate here, you discover you start up at the high frequency end and you start chopping away frequencies. You start 20, 90, 80, and so forth. You get down, you discover that when you removed everything but 35 to 30 kilohertz, the animal is performing just fine in an easy delay discrimination task. But if you remove everything below 30 kilohertz and 25 kilohertz, they can't see the echo. That makes no sense. This makes sense. There's no frequencies left. It's gone. All right. But now what happens if you go in the other direction? You have all of the en energy in the sound here, and you remove only the 20 to 30 kilohertz part, and then 35 kilohertz. They still can't do it. They have to see the lowest frequencies in the echo in order to treat the sound as an echo at all. All right? That makes sense because remember I said that the lowest frequencies illuminate the entire scene and the higher frequencies only illuminate the frontal part of the scene. So they're telling us they know that fact. Okay, yeah. Has anybody got a pointer to lend Jim because we actually can't see when he does yeah, I know. Indication. Let me, um, I don't have a pointer. The, and the, the pointer on the, the, when you're running in PowerPoint doesn't show up on the screen. Uh, um, yeah, and I can't go, well, actually, I can't go over there. Look, we have lots of wire, okay? Here, this will do. I, I can do this by hand. Well, All right, okay. I have no clue. <laughs> how, do, how does it turn on? Oh, the bottom. Okay, there we go. Okay. okay. That's a this should very work. Very broad focus, but. Um... No, I'll use my hands. Uh, no, let's just do it this way. What we're doing here is we're reducing the frequency content of the echo. If you have all of those frequencies in the echo, and you start chopping away from the high end, you're removing this, 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 this. Nothing happens until you get down to 30, 35 kilohertz, and then when you remove the last little bit of the echo, the bat can't perform the task, all right? It's a distance discrimination task, just as in the pictures I showed you, okay? And so that makes sense. I mean, you take all the echo frequencies out, there's no echo, the bat can't use it. But if you go in the other direction, you have all these frequencies present, and you take out only the 25 to 35 kilohertz part, they also can't do it. So bat's processing rule essentially is it has to have the low frequencies in order to do anything with it. And, okay. No, no, let's, let's leave the computer alone. I know what will happen now, okay? <laughs> This is a Dell computer. They're made in China, this particular one. Um, the monitor for my computer is a Colonel Liu who operates out of a university in Hong Kong. No, sorry, it's Shanghai. And so if I forget my password, I just say, Colonel Liu, do you remember what my password is? And he says, sure. <laughs> he sends it to me. Okay. Every computer has a Chinese intelligence officer on the other side of the screen. Oh, good. Oh, that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. That one there. Okay. This is the, the green ones are bad because they can really ruin your eyes. They're much more energy, okay? All right, so basically what you have is a situation where the frequencies are not equal to each other. The bat has to have all, has the lowest frequencies in order to see anything. And that's telling us stuff, but we'll come back to that. Okay, now I talked to you about the shape reconstruction and the blurring. Now let's go and look at what echoes look like from the point of view of shape. Um, say you have a moth or a target that's shaped like a kind of a dumbbell. You have a front to it and a back to it. The bat's task is to determine the, dis the length of the bar in the dumbbell. That's how they tell the size and the shape of an object in terms of the, the, the beginning and the end of the echo sequence in distance. Echoes, insects have sizes for a big brown bass between about half a centimeter and about five centimeters, which is covered by this box region here. Echoes for coming from objects like insects in this size range have two or more of these little nulls in the spectrum. You see these little holes in the spectrum here, these little horizontal or slanted bars. Here are two or three of them here, here are three or four, five or six, eight or 10, and so forth. 
For echoes that are arri arriving from an object smaller than about half a centimeter, there are interference notches in the echoes, but they're too broad and too far apart to be detected as nulls. They just it looks like coloration of the spectrum, but not as a pattern of notches or nulls, which you see right here. Past about half a centimeter, the echoes are far enough apart that you no longer get interference. You can I say, oh, there's two echoes there. You can see that there's one reflection and another reflection separated by events in time. That's ob that object is producing two echoes, but it's too big to be an insect. The bats classify insects by whether or not the echo has several of these discrete sharp reflections along its frequency, along the spectrogram's frequency axis. For longer ones, they see two echoes. It's too big to be an insect. It's going to be two objects, completely independent objects. For smaller objects, there's not enough nulls to determine the spacing. In particular, it turns out they have to see the nulls in the first harmonic. In this case here, there's a null here, there's another one hiding in there, here there's several here, but over here, the first harmonic is so obliterated by the nulls that you can't tell it's a harmonic. You have to see this ripple pattern, that's what they're looking for, a ripple pattern in the spectrum. All right. I, know, I just want to over, don't want to overdo this. Uh, let's go to the next one. It's easier. That red box in the, per, in the first slide is now reproduced here on a graph of frequency and glint separation from about 30 to about 300 microseconds. But this is a scattering of data points for the sharpness of frequency tuning of neurons in the bat's midbrain, auditory midbrain the inferior colliculus. The bat has neurons that are tuned to individual frequencies with enough sharpness that they can find individual interference notches in the spectrum. But they don't have neurons that are tuned so coarsely that they can see the interference nulls up here. So if I go back like this here, they don't have neurons that can say these echoes have nulls. They only have neurons that tell you these are. But, Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, okay. Good point. I keep forgetting that this is a fatal property of. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Okay. okay. Here, an insect has an insect is going to be between about half a centimeter and about five centimeters for big brown bats. The largest insect that they will eat would be flying katydids or flying praying mantises, which are quite big. Um, Half a, a half a centimeter is typical for a small June beetle or a small moth or a mayfly. That's the sort of thing they'll eat. These echoes, um, easy, can, you can easily see that there's a rippling of these interference nulls along the frequency axis, the vertical axis of the spectrograms, starting about here and going over to about here. For longer echo delay differences between the front and the back of the insect, five centimeters more, you can see that there are two independent echoes there and there are no interference nulls. The absence of these interference nulls tells the bat it's not an insect, it's two different objects. It's a kind of size classification. Um, if the bat has a wing spread of 30 centimeters, it would probably not want to try to eat something that was 10 centimeters long anyway because it might well turn out to be dangerous. Okay, Over here, for, echo, for objects that have dimensions smaller than about a centimeter, you can see that these interference nulls stop having that ripple characteristic and start becoming obliterations of significant parts of the band. So you have an interference null here, and it's actually removed most of the second harmonic up here. By the time you get down to nine, eight, seven, six microseconds, we're talking about objects with dimensions of a couple of millimeters, smaller than five millimeters, the effects of the overlap of the reflection are minimal. The bats want ripple in the spectrogram to say that's an insect, okay? I apologize for forgetting the, the pointer. Okay, now here, we're looking at how bats detect ripples. Uh, there we go. There we go. All right. This is the frequency axis here of the spectrogram. But, um, it's, on the, it's rotated now. Frequency from 20 to 100 kilohertz, the bandwidth of the first harmonic, the second harmonic, the glint spacing here. Bats can see as an insect objects that have spacings between about 30 and about 300 microseconds. Um, but for shorter spacings, 
up here and for longer spacings down here, you don't see the green dots. Now the green dots represent the frequency tuning and the tuning width for different neurons in the bat's auditory midbrain. So here you have a neuron that's tuned to about 60 kilohertz and likes to respond to, near, to interference nulls that fit time delays of about 35 microseconds. The bats basically got a system for finding interference nulls in the spectrum, to finding the ripples at each frequency, but only if the ripples are well-defined as in this case here. So the red rectangle here and the red rectangle here tie the objects, the bat's perceptions, and the neural tuning for finding the rippling holes on the spectrum. The next graph, everybody okay so far? I mean, it's not perfect, but we're doing what we can. Next slide here. That's interesting too, the word slide. We use PowerPoint now. Anybody remember what a slide was? <laughs> All right, it's kind of like a phonograph. And some people alive still know what might, one might be. When I, I teach a course on hearing, with well, this past year it had 270 students. Not one of them knew what a phonograph was. Because I was trying to explain, if you take a phonograph record and look at it, you see sound waves inscribed on plastic. They were, oh, that's very crude. Why do they do it that way? <laughs> All right, here we go. This is a graph, I don't want to go into too many details. This is a behavioral test of the bat's ability to discriminate differences between different glint structures. I don't want to go into the details, but the main point is, if this is the glint spacing here in microseconds, this is the size spacing in centimeters here, the bat's deconvolution system can be thought of as an amplifier that has a frequency response that covers only this region right here. This is a behavioral measure of the bat's deconvolution system, which is essentially the, a behavioral measure of what in vision is the equivalent of the retina's resolution for small object shapes. All right. I don't want to go into the details of that now, but if anybody wants to ask about that, either run to the microphone or wait. No. <laughs> okay, so far? All right, this is a deconvolution system. All right. Um, now let's just do a little bit on the auditory system itself. It's just to show you some things and then we'll be done. All right. So your patience will shortly be rewarded by an opportunity to forget about it. All right. This is a fairly complicated diagram, which we put together to explain to the Office of Naval Research what we wanted to do with their money for five years. And we struck gold. And so I'll be retiring in five years and two milliseconds. All right. The, basically what happens if this is the signals the bat emits, this green, oh, you are, there we go, the damn pointer, yeah. Here we go. You know, I think if I turned it off and showed the PowerPoint, not as a presentation, but as a screenshot, the, the arrow, which anyway, here we are. Here we have a bat sound, the transmitted signal in green with the two harmonics, the bat goes chirp. Here we have an echo from an insect right here at a short time delay, in several milliseconds, and it's red. And it's essentially a replica of the broadcast arriving at a short time delay. Here you have an echo coming from off to the side from a branch of a tree, for example, that's not on the axis of the bat's aim. And you see the second harmonic is noticeably weaker as a result of it being off axis. And that will cause the deconvolution system to see a dis, disjoint uh, time delay. We'll come to that. This just shows that the transmitted signal has a beam aim in both horizontal and vertical dimensions. And that if you think of this circle as a hemisphere in front of the bat, both the sound and the receiving pattern cover most of the hemisphere. They're not using a pencil beam of sound like a flashlight. They're illuminating the entire space. All right. The bat's auditory system the cochlea segments the frequencies in the sound in numerous parallel frequency tune channels in much the same way we do, where the mechanical traveling wave of the basilar membrane breaks the sound up into different frequency bins, which are represented by responses in different neurons in the auditory nerve. So each auditory nerve neuron is sampling one of the frequencies in this whole band here. Transmitted sound, echo from insect, echo from, from the uh, branches of trees, like that. Each frequency 
this point right here, for example, over here, produces an, an electrical excitation in the neuron, which causes a spike to occur on the rising side of this excitation. And then there's a decay. You get a single spike right here that's synchronized to the sound. Any other spikes will occur in a random time, and they're suppressed in the bat's auditory system because all the neurons only spike once. That is different from the visual system, where when you present a stimulus to the eyes, neurons in the visual system will still go like that, lots of spikes. Okay, and visual neurophysiologists have tended to ignore the possibility that the timing of any one of those spikes might change your perception. That won't work in the auditory system because there aren't multiple spikes. Each stimulus element produces only one spike. So everything has to be coded by the time of occurrence of spikes, not by the number of spikes. That's crucially different, okay, than probably a lot of the rest of the brain. All right, let's go back to here. The time frequency representation the bat uses, which is like a spectrogram, but the frequency axis tends to be logarithmic. First harmonic here, each of these green dots is a spike. Second harmonic here, each of the green dots is a spike, a putative spike. Echo coming back, each of these green dots here is a spike. Each of these green dots here is a spike. Bats determine time delay by measuring the time that elapses between this spike and this spike at each frequency. And the way they do this is much the same way we perceive pitch. There we go. By having the, this spike right here is the one that happens in the auditory nerve. The auditory midbrain repeats that spike, click, 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 over and over and over in a neural time delay consisting of lots of neurons, each producing one spike, but slightly different times. That's a, time, a neural time delay mechanism, a delay line. All right, and then when the echo comes back, you get a spike caused by the echo. And what the bat does is it figures out what number along this pink row of dots are this green thing most coincides. And that's the bat's readout of time delay. It's a delay line system, multiple delay lines at each frequency, lots and lots of time delays, which results in the brain, the auditory midbrain structure, the inferior colliculus in bats being enormous, absolutely enormous, many, many neurons to create all the time delays. All right. And then these are fed onto the bat's auditory cortex. And I'm not going to talk about the details of this. I just want to point something out. That each of the neurons, well, I can do it here. Neurons in the bat's auditory cortex have these frequent, have these delay tuning curves. So for example, this, this kind of rust colored one here responds to time delays in this band here. And so it might go from say 10 to 14 milliseconds, which is a gigantic amount of space. Yes. A naive question. Um, my understanding is that in vision, um, the number of spikes, or like the uh, fre frequency of spikes, is indicative of the strength of signal. Yes.
couple of slides and we'll be done. Okay, so you have a neuron here, which represents the readout of one of these time delay points. The coincidence of the green and the pink is done with a precision of some hundreds of microseconds. All right, that's registered in the cortex with a precision of perhaps two to four milliseconds. Long time delay errors. When you do experiments on the ability of the bat to actually perceive changes in time delays under highly controlled conditions, don't want to uh, overdo this, but here, this is, this is an axis in microseconds here. Zero is the time at which the echo actually arrived in a virtual reality experiment. Zero microseconds might be, say, three or four milliseconds time delay. And this is the shape of a function. It's the cross-correlation function of the echo with the pulse. I don't want to go into the details, but what you can imagine it is from an informational point of view, if you take the pulse and the echo and you squeeze them and get all the information about time out of that combination and no other information, you get this shape right here, all right? It's essentially what's the, what's the ideal accuracy of measuring time. And then you do an experiment with the bat, and these dots are the results of experiments with bats where the bat can detect time delay changes of one or two microseconds in this experiment here. In other words, it makes lots of errors when both the test and the, the probe echo have the same time delay, but if you shift them by a few microseconds, the errors go down to nearly nothing, okay? When you invert the phase of the echo, by that I mean you make all the cycles that are positive, negative, and negative, positive, and you do the same experiment, you discover that the bat perceives the time delay in terms of the phase of the structure of the echo uh, in units of microseconds. This is a major challenge for auditory science because most auditory scientists would say you can't see phase above maybe one kilohertz or so, and yet they're operating in the 20 to 100 kilohertz range. Well, we know how to do that, but I won't go into it. I just want to show you two more things here, and we're done right here. Imagine here, this is, there's three slides to cartoons, and then we're done. All right. There we go, and then I can spend the rest of my loonies and escape, right? <laughs> here we go. Um, there's the bat sound and the echo right here. What the bat sound in measuring, what the bat does in measuring time delay between here and here, independent of between here and here, it does something that's called dechirping. In other words, it takes these FM sweeps and it removes them from its internal display. So it measures the time delay between the pulse and the echo at each of these separate frequencies. And if the echo has got the same spectrum as the broadcast, all of these time delays are the same, and these green dots line up vertically like this with the green dots for the broadcast. And this alignment produces a very sharp estimated echo delay, the bat's equivalent of the kind of pitch that we would perceive for a musical note. Okay, now, if the echo, in fact, has several nulls in its spectrum caused by interference between reflections from the head and the tail of the insect, like this. Some of these nulls are these nulls consist of weakness in the amplitude of the sound at that frequency. The auditory system, and in general the nervous system, encodes reductions in amplitude, not by a smaller number, which is the way a digital computer works, it encodes the reduction in the, in the amplitude by a delay in the nerve spikes. It's called amplitude latency trading. The weaker the sound, the later the time delay of the neural response it evokes, something that was observed um, in the work begun by Luigi Galvani. So this is an old story, okay? Weaker sounds, weaker stimuli, produce later twitches of the frog sciatic nerve muscles, okay? It's a simple observation. When the bat does the dechirping, which takes these sloping plots and puts them vertically here, now it's very obvious that this frequency and this frequency and this frequency coincide with weakness in the reflection relative to the strength of the original broadcast. It's this, the shape of the spectrum of the sound, which is in units of amplitude, has been transposed into the timing of nerve spikes in milliseconds or microseconds. So all of the information about the object is still in the timing of nerve spikes. It never goes to a place where a spot on a screen gets weaker. 
Instead, it goes to a place where the timing of the spikes becomes later. And this scalloped pattern right here produces not only the perception of the delay of the echo, but perception of the spacing of the nulls and thus the head to tail size of the insect. The last slide now. Okay. What happens, <clears throat> what happens when an echo is low pass filtered because it's coming from clutter off to the side? Here you have the transmitted signal, here you have the echo. Now these frequencies are all much weaker because the, the echo, the leaf in this case, off to the side, is not receiving the full strength of the broadcast in the high frequencies compared to the low frequencies. When these dots are dechirped, what you see here is a vertical alignment of the broadcast, but the response pattern for the echo becomes misaligned relative to the nominal vertical stripe. This misalignment represents the, the, the dissonance of the harmonics because the harmonics are being artificially changed relative to each other in the nervous system by amplitude spike latency trading not by an acoustic effect, not by something in the inner ear or in the external ear, by a neural computation. This neural computation allows the bat to do fast regulation of shape and suppression of the surrounding clutter. It's a computational system that works on the timing of nerve impulses in an analog domain, and we have never seen anything like this before. It was never built in the 1950s or 1960s. Back in about 1968, I think, or 1972, I asked Marvin Minsky about this, a well-known, recently deceased computer scientist who thought he knew a lot about the nervous system. He didn't. He didn't know any more than we do. Okay? I mean, one single good sentence about what the brain does. Come on, let's hear it. We have no idea about that sentence, what words would go into it. All we can say is, well, all right. Anyway, Marvin Minsky, I asked him if he thought the brain operated as a digital computer. He says, of course, it's digital. He was a very smart man, but he wasn't right about that. He did invent the confocal microscope, which was a real achievement, not bad for a college freshman. I think he was actually a high school student. Anyway, this is the end of it. So if you have any questions, this is the time to, to, to ask them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. I think. That so I've never seen this before, that in the middle of a talk, the conference organizers stepped up and said, to hell with the discussion, we want to hear more of your speech. My so, experience is that the, the organizer says, to hell with the speaker, we want to go to the next person. <laughs> well, so that I think that just is... is there. Sir? Okay, so much of the discussion will be postponed to this afternoon for the four o'clock session when Jim will also be present, but we can have five minutes for short questions right now, if you have any burning questions. Uh, hey. um, it's kind of a two-parter. Um, do you ever get approached by Tesla? Did I what? Do you ever get approached by Tesla? Tesla Automotives? Uh, no, Musk. Okay, I was well, approached by a different company called ThyssenKrupp. They make torpedoes in Germany that are acoustically guided. They asked us if we could help them. I didn't know how to answer that, having known what, what both Thyssen and Krupp had done in recent years. I was born all along enough ago to know what had happened. <laughs> okay. All right, so excuse my naivety, but uh, as a layperson, I only hear about this stuff in popular culture from like, Elon Musk stubbornly um, believing that so he can go, he can make fully autonomous cars with only sonar. Sure. And um, what the problems they've been having is be being able to detect, uh, since they use the Doppler shift, being able to detect things in motion, mm -hmm. but they discriminate um, static objects because it's too much computation. So I was wondering, um, is, is the static object the, the clutter in a sense? Okay, a good way to, well, this is a complicated question. So the, the basic idea is can you build a, a self-driving car that uses a radar that, to guide itself? That's sort of what's underneath all this, right? Yes, but my main question is basically about the bat. How, how does, um, it's maybe a very basic question that you may have answered, but how does the bat discriminate from things in motion from, uh, from static? Uh, okay, these bats emit a very wide range of frequencies and they sample the entire field of objects in terms of lots of different time delay estimates. 
And when something is mo moving, the next time they emit a chirp, they get different time delays because objects are going closer or to the side or farther away. A Doppler shift doesn't enter into this okay. because the very wide band of the signal makes it so good at measuring time delay that the perturbations from a Doppler shift, that's another issue. Uh, there are bats in the world, there are a couple of hundred species of bats called horseshoe bats. Instead of going chirp, 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 they go beep, 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 and they detect Doppler shifts. They can detect an insect that's flying at a different velocity than they are because the echo has been Doppler shifted because the insect is moving differently. And more important, remember I told you that the, the hour bats detect changes in the head and the tail position of the insect? The bats that use Doppler shifts do that too, but they detect it as Doppler flutter because the wings are producing repetitive Doppler shifts. If the, the bat, if the insect's wings meet, beat 30 times a second, the echo coming back is not beep, it's me like that. And when you have a fluttering echo like that, these bats will instantly attack because they know it's, it's a living thing. Okay, so you better call Elon Musk and tell him he's doing it wrong. Yeah. That's a good question because time and frequency are related, but you have to work one against the other. Okay. A, tor a, a, a radar for finding tornadoes uses Doppler shifts. A radar for finding airplanes doesn't. It uses time delays. Let me ask the students, please, to the, or anybody, to put your questions on the blog and then ask them during the panel session now. Because uh, the other option is we, we'll finish the video part, and if you want in real time to ask them, but I think it's better to wait until the panel session, and everybody can benefit from Jim's answers. I'll take. Uh, I'll let Lars say the last words for Jim. Oh, I I just wanted to congratulate you on what was an absolutely fantastic presentation once again. So thank you very much. <laughs>